Um, all right, so I am going to just jump in. I have a lot of content. I'm hopefully going to get through most or all of it. Um, fake news, misinformation, political propaganda, information war. In the, in the last couple of years, we've been introduced to a lot of new terms. Not always new. We've been introduced to a several terms that um, attempt to describe some of the toxicities that we've been perceiving in, in our information spaces. And I'm going to focus on a subsection of this problem and on one term in particular, disinformation. And I'm going to talk to you about it in the context that we've been studying it, online during crisis events. We've been looking at disinformation for several years now, but we didn't start out with the intent to focus on it. Like many online users these days, we just kind of stumbled into it, stumbled down the rabbit hole. My first line of research was examining digital volunteerism during crisis events, how volunteers organize themselves using online tools to help people during natural disasters, man-made disasters, and political protest events. In 2013, my collaborators and I set out to study online rumors during crisis events. And in late 2015, early 2016, we began to realize that we weren't just looking at accidental rumors and misinformation, we were seeing pervasive disinformation. And that soon became the focus of our research. I've got a few different goals for this talk. Um, mostly, I want to try to help you understand what disinformation is and how it works. I'm going to situate the term in some historical context. I'm going to um, provide some recent case studies of, on, of online disinformation. I'm going to use those to correct some misperceptions, some misperce misperceptions and add some nuance to help us understand really um, how disinformation works. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about some implications for the design of technology and policy around, and platform policy in particular, around disinformation. The first thing I want to do is distinguish between misinformation and disinformation. The differences between the two are especially important when we start to think about solutions. One high level way to characterize the distinction is simply as a matter of intent. Misinformation is information that is false, but not necessarily deliberately so. And disinformation is intentionally false information. From a high level, I think this definition works. This is the one I give my undergraduate students in my class. But in another view, disinformation isn't simply about intent. The term disinformation has other more specific meanings, a historical context. It's been used to describe a particular kind of political propaganda that's been connected to this term, desinformatia originating in Soviet intelligence. Our understanding of disinformation is informed by the work of Ladislav Bittman, who was a practitioner of Soviet disinformation, a member of Czech intelligence. He defected the United States in 1968 and became a professor of disinformation studies, as he called it. Much of what we know about the historical use of disinformation, we learned from him. Borrowing from Bittman, we define disinformation as a suite of tactics applied by influence agents to manipulate information spaces to achieve strategic political objective. <coughs> it's important to note that not all disinformation, historical or modern, is connected to Russia. I think that's really important, especially uh, right now in the election context of the US. However, Russia has been innovators in this space, and we're going to appreciate them for, um, for some of their uh, innovation. And I'm going to present three case studies uh, of online disinformation, two with actually very strong connections to Russia's inf intelligence and influence apparatus, and another that's a bit more tenuously connected, which I'll talk about as we go. These were long-term studies that took place over the course of multiple years within our lab. And I'm going to look at these uh, studies through a CSCW, computer-supported cooperative work, kind of perspective. <coughs> Looking at disinformation as a kind of collaborative work between agents, not the agents we think about in computer science, but um, between uh, influence agents and crowds. In our lab, we apply a socio-technical lens, exploring the relationship between social and technical structure and action, how technology, the technologies that many of you build, um, how technology, social norms, and social behavior are mutually structuring. And through this lens and this work, we focus on the collaborative aspects of an inherently complex system, studying how diverse and distributed groups of people connect and work together towards various outcomes, intentional and otherwise. And how that activity is shaped by the environments they work within and the norms and socio-technical structures that in turn take shape there. You're going to hear a little of this language as I go talking about shaping. I hope to bring some of it together, um, but you might have to read our, our recent paper, our CSW paper that's coming out soon to get more insight into kind of how those things work together. But this perspective also informs our methodological approach, and our methods are likely why, why I'm here today, why I ended up being an expert of disinformation, which was not my intention at all. Um, our work builds off of methodological innovation in crisis informatics. Our methods are profoundly mixed. 
we conduct iterative, qualitative, and quantitative interpretive uh, analysis of big and small social data and other online content. We look at the data from different perspectives, using high-level quantifications and visualizations to see patterns and anomalies in the data, but also willing, being willing and anxious to roll up our sleeves and dive into the data to analyze by hand thousands of data points of content. We repeatedly go back and forth between views at 10,000 feet and tweet by tweet. Speaking of tweets, uh, to some extent, all three of our case studies are cross-platform studies, but the seed data for all of them was Twitter data because that data has been public, and that has huge implications about what we know about disinformation, um, and we can talk about some of that at the end, hopefully. All right, so I'm going to jump into these case studies, and it's going to be a lot of information all at once, and hopefully I'm going to bring some of it back around at the end to kind of show you how these case studies inform our understanding of disinformation. The first case study is on Russian interference in the 2016 US election. This week we heard about another report from the US Senate Intel Committee um, reinforcing the now established claims of interference. In our case, as I said before, we didn't set out to study disinformation. We were actually initially studying framing, in this study, we were studying framing contests in Black Lives Matter discourse, primarily between Black Lives Matter activists who were advocating against systemic injustice and police violence against African Americans and a counter movement of conservative accounts that attempted to challenge and denigrate the Black Lives Matter message. This conversation was highly polarized. From data collected relating to shooting events in 2016, we generated a data set of tweets that had either Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter in the text. As part of that work, we created a structural graph of retweets in the data. In this graph, each node or circle is an account, and the accounts are clustered together when they retweeted each other and further apart when they didn't. The edges here are retweets, but they're invisible in this view. The graph revealed two separate communities or echo chambers on either side of the conversation. Pro-Black Lives Matter on the left, where the accounts were mostly politically left-leaning or liberal, and anti-Black Lives Matter on the right, where accounts were consistently politically right-leaning or conservative. When people talk about online polarization, this is what it looks like structurally. The two sides created and spread very different frames about police shootings of African American citizens. At times, the discourse was emo emotional, divisive, and honestly uncomfortable for our research team. We managed to complete the study in October 2017. It was a CSEW paper. A few weeks later in November, Twitter released a list of accounts associated with the Internet Research Agency, or IRA, in St. Petersburg, Russia, which was running disinformation operations online during that time targeting US populations. I saw a link to that list one night, um, I think the day that they released it, um, in a tweet, uh, because that's what I was doing that night. Um, and I went to take a look. <laughs> Looking it over, I instantly recognized some of the accounts. We'd featured a couple of them in examples in our Black Lives Matter paper. Um, their handles were in our tables. Their tweets were in our text. I sent my students, who thankfully weren't hanging out on Twitter, uh, to take a look at, at the list as well. Uh, they decided to cross-reference that list with our graph. Um, our graph, uh, and to see where the IRA trolls were in the conversation. And this might not surprise you now, but it actually did surprise us then. This is that graph. The trolls, uh, the troll accounts are in orange. Retweets of the trolls are also mapped as orange lines connecting the retweeter with the troll. This graph reveals Russian disinformation agents were active on both sides of the Black Lives Matter conversation. A few were among the most influential accounts in the conversation. An orange account on the left was retweeted by Jack at Twitter and me. Several orange accounts on the right had integrated into other grassroots online organizing efforts on the conservative side, perhaps through follow-back mechanisms. My PhD student, Emmer Arif, uh, conducted in-depth qualitative, who was also uh, integral in this earlier research, both the Black Lives Matter framing and the, the, um, the graphing. Uh, he conducted in-depth qualitative research on the accounts in orange. He found that the IRA accounts enacted multi-dimensional online personas across platforms that played on stereotypes of African Americans on one side and white US conservatives on the other. They were impersonating activists and also modeling for others what activism, what online activism looked like, reflecting norms, but to some extent shaping them. Often their content wasn't superficially problematic or even any different from what others in the space were doing. They were tweeting about strong black voices on the left or support of US veterans on the right. They were cultivating audiences for future strategic messaging. In other places, they were sowing and amplifying division. Some of their content was among the most vitriolic content in the space. 
advocating for violence against police on the left and using ra racial epithets on the right. In a few cases, we can see them holding arguments with themselves, like a puppeteer having one of their accounts on the left fight with one of their accounts on the right. We now have a much more complete view of the IRA activity. In 2018, through their Project Sunlight, Twitter released all of the tweets from the IRA accounts that they had identified as part of this operation. In total, they, th they found more than 3,000 accounts, and those accounts sent about 3 million tweets in English, which is, uh, which is this graph here. So it is a temporal graph of, of this activity. The retweets are down here. Oh, sorry, the tweets are down here um, in the brighter color, and the retweets are up there in the darker gray. What you can see here is that for years, the IRA troll accounts toiled in relative obscurity. They picked up few retweets, and they had few followers. But that all began to change around December 2015. And that was right after they began to establish those political personas that we had accidentally found in our study. These political personas, um, African American uh, Black Lives Matter activists, which will be blue on the next graph you see, and US white conservatives, which will be red on the next graph you see. When they began to perform these personas, their accounts started finally to gain traction, to get retweets and follows. Nearly 85% of the retweets that the IRA accounts received in total were retweets of less than 300 accounts dedicated to the political personas that we showed above. In other words, the IRA trolls, the disinformation operations, were most effective not in spreading fake news, which is one of their other things that they did, but in infiltrating online political communities. Stepping back, what you can see here is a multi-year campaign to infiltrate and shape political discourse in the United States, orchestrated by a group with ties to the Russian government. And we can see them burrowing into and working within, and in some cases with, otherwise organic online communities to spread their narratives to achieve their, the agent's goals. We can categorize this activity as orchestrated, which is gonna contrast with some of our upcoming, example, upcoming examples. It was coordinated by a single organization inside a building in St. Petersburg. We don't, know how much, we don't know much about how they worked, although we do have a couple of accounts of people who infiltrated and came out. Um, however, we can assume, assume for the most part that it was formally organized, and another way, oh, sorry, I'm going to get to that later. I'm going to skip that one. Um, so, uh, so, so the important thing here um, is, is to think about this. This is one, uh, uh, this is an, event, uh, an effort that was, it was orchestrated, and it's going to contrast a little bit to what we see next. So the second case study um, looks at disinformation during armed conflict. Since 2017, and this is a going to be a huge shift, and it's going to be a little heavy, so I apologize. Since 2017, we've been conducting research on online discourse related to the civil war in Syria. In this research, we focused on conversations surrounding the work of the Syria Civil Defense, also known as the White Helmets, a volunteer rescue group that works in rebel-held areas of Syria. This group does search and rescue and provides medical aid to people impacted by the civil war there. The White Helmets also, it's important, they also document those impacts, often calling out the impacts of airstrikes by uh, Syria's Russian allies and atrocities such as chemical weapons attacks. The tweet above that I just added, a recent one, specifically calls out the Assad regime's Russian allies and claiming they specifically target aid workers. The White Helmets content like this and other, and other tweets and videos that they've created has served to some extent to garner solidarity with and sympathy for the Syrian people from Western audiences. In 2016, they were the focus of an Oscar-winning documentary, which likely catalyzed a little bit of the content that we see next, which is a campaign against them. In 2017, 2018, when we started studying this conversation, if you searched Twitter or Google for white helmets, you may have found some tweets supporting them. But most likely, you would have encountered content like this, content that challenges the white helmets, claiming that they're a propaganda construct of the West, equating them with terrorists, or calling them crisis actors. In our research in this conversation, we began, as we always do, with a, a collection of tweets that contained, in this case, the term white helmets from a larger connection, a collection related to Syria. This is one representation of that data set. In the center of this graph is a retweet network graph of that conversation. The accounts are sized by um, the number of retweets they received, and they're connected to other accounts that retweeted them. And again, you can see this sort of polarization. There's two sides to the conversation. Using a community detection algorithm, we identified two major, major clusters of accounts in this conversation, pro-white pro -white helmets accounts in blue and anti-white helmets accounts in red or pink. 
As you can see, the red cluster is dominating this conversation. Their activity is persistent over time. Many of the same accounts repeatedly tweeting and retweeting content that specifically attacks the white helmets. They are literally drowning out the voices of the other side. So who are these accounts on the right that are dominating this conversation? The top influencers include self-described journalists that consistently produce content aligned with Syrian and Russian government interests. There are also officials from the Syrian government and other governments in the space. And there are a few of what seem to be inauthentic or likely paid or organizationally controlled troll accounts. So those are all in there. In some cases, they're, in, they're influencers. But inauthentic troll accounts make up a tiny percentage of the overall content in this space. Most of, uh, of these people are either journalists who's, who are who they say they are or what we would call um, sincere activists. We didn't, though we went looking for them, we did not find bots contributing to this conversation in any way. And I would say that few of these accounts were, were paid trolls. Most of the accounts in red are unaffiliated accounts who identify as activists. Many have been active in other political conversations. A large portion of them have, treated, have tweeted pro-Palestinian content in the past. They were part of another online community that was organized around that task. Many also identify as anti-imperialist and anti-war, things that many of our students that are studying this might have used to describe themselves and still do. These are pe real people who are sincere believers of the content they're sharing. And many of them look a lot like us. And what are they doing? They're participating in what looks very much like online activism. They share articles and videos that support their narratives. They mention each other a lot. Um, they whistle and collectively dogpile content that supports the White Helmets. I should know, that's how I first encountered them. I put up like an image of the different media where, that were involved in this conversation, and I just got all of a sudden dogpiled like I'd never been before by, by handles that I would soon recognize in my data, but didn't yet um, at the time. So these accounts, these activists are persistent. They tweet about the right White Helmets for months and years. They activate at opportune times to capitalize on new information that can help them make their case and to distract from breaking news events that are not aligned with their narratives. And they organize. In many ways, they look like the online disaster volunteers I used to study, using Twitter and other platforms to coordinate and collaborate to recruit new members to spread their messages. This is very much collaborative work. They use some of the same techniques that I'd been studying from disaster volunteers in, after the Haiti earthquake in 2010, although their techniques are a lot more uh, advanced and a little bit savvier nowadays. All right, so switching a little bit to a different part of the structure of what's happening here. Around the outside of this graph is actually a different kind of node. These are web domains or websites that are linked to from the tweets shared by accounts in the center part of the graph. These domains are sized relative to the number of tweets that, they, that link to each, and they're colored according to the proportion of tweets coming from the red and blue sides of the graph. You can see here that YouTube is the most, most prominent um, uh, URL that we have in our data. This is the, the, the domain that's cited the most. Um, it was a resource for the anti-White Helmets content uh, that was going on in, in red and that activity. Um, we are still unpacking that, so I don't have a lot of results there on that, but it is something that's very interesting in this conversation. But I want to focus on this part of the graph here. Two of the top domains that support this conversation are RT, formerly Russia Today, and Sputnik News. Both domains are part of Russia, the Russian government's media and influence apparatus. In the White Helmets conversation, these news domains provide uh, content, including video content of the conflict and interviews, interviews with voices that share their objectives. They shape narratives. They amplify voices of anti-White Helmets influencers. They repeatedly interview the journalists who are among the most retweeted in this conversation and other influencers. Often these influencers then link back to their interviews on RT, this sort of cross-platform promotion and it actually moves over to YouTube as well. They're doing sort of cross-platform promotion in some ways to try to make their content look bigger and broader than, than it is. Um, and so we kind of see this influence of the Russian government in this larger conversation. Uh, there are other domains in pink that function as a kind of gray propaganda, consistently repeating the same kind of narratives we see on RT and Sputnik. In some cases, the same anti-white helmets articles appear across all of these different or many of these different um, domains at once. It's another paper. I won't have time to go into that here, but we've studied that as well. So when we step back here, this is a persistent campaign of at least partially organic political activism supported by the Russian government's media apparatus and the Syrian regime as well, and in, 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 and in, in alignment with their strategic objectives. It's not orchestrated. 
in the same way that we saw above. It's more cultivated. The Russian information apparatus amplifies friendly voices, provides a platform for journalists whose stories align with their narratives, and lifts their profiles. They host content on their flagship sites, but they also allow their content to flow through these various gray propaganda sites. And they encourage their viewers to question more while spreading dozens of narratives that attempt to sow doubt about who the White Helmets are and what they do. All right, so I'm going to move on to the third case study. This one is not as practiced as the other two, so I might stumble through it a little bit. It's a little bit older. Um, this was uh, actually our first paper on disinformation was about this, but I'm putting it last because it shows a different kind or different state of a disinformation campaign. Um, and we've actually been looking at this conversation for a long time. So in 2013, when we first embarked on our studying uh, studies of online rumoring, the first event we looked at was the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. This is a tweet uh, sent uh, from a, the same day as, uh, as the bombings. It was maybe uh, 18 hours later, I think. The Boston bombing smells like a CIA black ops false flag setup. Again, don't be fooled by the mainstream media lies. We, I, 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 I'm laughing because nowadays it's like, oh, yeah, like when we first put this up there, like, oh, that's so weird. And now we hear these same things all the time um, because they're so, they're so pervasive. Um, so for us, when we first encountered this, it was, a, it was part of a strange rumor uh, that was very different from the other rumors we were studying. It claimed that the event hadn't happened ha as the media was describing, but that it was a false flag that was really perpetrated by the CIA. Over time, across other events that we were studying, we kept seeing this same kind of rumor in event after event after event. They would say that it was a false flag with hidden perpetrators, or that it was a hoax event staged by crisis actors. Each new event spawned a new round of conspiracy theorizing. Though the same themes came up again and again, um, Western governments are targeting their own people, the media is lying to you, what, and these same things. So we could see the same narratives, but each time a new event would kind of spawn a new way of, new evidence that they would tie into these sort of old theories. One thing that always interests us about this from the very first time we did the study was that the, these strange websites that they cited, this was, to be honest, um, these were better days, but this was the first time I encountered Infowars, uh, was in our, my, in my 2013, uh, well, all of us, we were hand coding these things and we're like, what is Infowars? And we went there and I'm sure our computers were never the same. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't just Infowars. RT was in these places, Your Newswire, Veterans Today, Activist Post, these, these websites with, with weird names, and it was just, it looked very different. So we mapped out this space using user co-sharing patterns, where the nodes are web domains connected when the same user tweets links to both sites. Um, and this is kind of a, a view of that map. I don't have a lot of time to unpack it, but essentially the sites in reds, red here were the ones that supported the conspiracy theorizing and explicitly contained content mentioning these conspiracy theories of crisis events. Um, the sites in blue tried to actively debunk these conspiracy theories. I'm not sure it worked, but they tried. Um, and the sites in yellow were actually brought into the conversation by people citing their articles as evidence for their conspiracy theory, but though the sites in yellow in this case weren't specifically mentioning. So they were part of the diet of a person who might be conspiracy theorizing, but not necessarily explicitly sharing a conspiracy theory in this case. So after the creating the graph here, I conducted content analysis of the different web domains. I dove into the red side of that graph. I don't necessarily recommend that. Uh, it took me a couple years. I feel like I'm finally recovered after a month or two of sabbatical and, um, and putting this all behind me. But it was, it's really, it was really disorienting. That analysis revealed this ecosystem to be supporting a variety of different conspiracy theories and pseudoscientific claims. They were critical of Western governments. They were anti-media, anti-science. The content consistently reflected populist ideologies and anti-Semitic themes. It also contained many and diverse claims about powerful people controlling world events, a sort of all-encompassing conspiracy theory through which each new event could be interpreted. Another thing we noticed was the presence of state-controlled media and think tanks uh, within primarily the red areas of the graph. These websites were resources for people uh, sharing this content, again, amplifying and shaping their views. Interestingly, that, that Ecosystem I just showed you has a very strong overlap with the media ecosystem supporting the anti-weight helmets discourse in our other study. And I could overlay that, but again, not enough time. Um, so this wasn't orchestrated, uh, but organic. Uh, strategically cultivated sometimes and amplified when useful by, 
by Russian, uh, Russian and other, actually Russia isn't the only one, there's Iranian um, outlets in the space and, and others as well. But they weren't, they weren't doing the conspiracy theorizing. The activity may be loosely tied to state-run uh, disinformation, but what actually happens is um, that, that, that people in, in, in the online communities are now so sort of um, embedded, having this kind of um, uh, epistemology or way of thinking about the world that when they see new information, they begin to, in a new event, they begin to interpret it through these same kinds of themes. And so for each new event, they generate new theories based on these old themes, explaining the event as another example of a grand conspiracy of powerful people manipulating events, and where the mainstream media lies to covers for them. They then assemble the evidence for new, each new event into a new conspiracy theory. We can often see them discussing, this is disgusting, sorry, discussing <laughs> shifting the theory over time to adapt to new evidence, trying to find the theory with the best fitness to spread beyond their community. They'll argue like, oh no, it's not a fast, false flag, it's a hoax event this time. Um, the community doesn't need any priming to run with, to run with a deep state uh, narrative about the 2016 uh, election interference. They had been playing with sim similar narratives for years, in some cases decades. These theories often start out organically, but they're, they can be amplified strategically. And what we've actually started to notice, which is one of the things that was so disorienting to us early and kind of pushed us into this line of research, was that these conspiracy theories and these ways of thinking and talking about things started to spread to influencers, media influencers, and actually political leaders, um, not just in the US, but in other places. So this conspiracy theorizing has begun to be mainstreamed in, in certain ways. We can see how deep state theories have found fertile ground in this kind of, um, kind of epistemic community. And an overlap in narrative suggests that QAnon, if you've heard of that, is an extension or expansion um, or a relative of, of this kind of epistemic community. All right, so case studies. <sighs> Um, those are our three case studies. You can see there's these different kinds. We've got orchestrated activity, sort of cultivated activity, and organic activity. We can also think of those as maybe different stages where the orchestrated activity that we saw in the Black Lives Matter was the early stage of a disinformation campaign. The, the Syria case, the White Helmets case, is more of a mid-level stage um, where they're still actively cultivating. And the conspiracy theorizing of, of crisis events is something that almost has, it, it has a, it, it's self-sustaining in, in many ways. All right, so I'm gonna use some of the material from these studies um, to revisit our understanding of disinformation. Uh, to share a couple of things about what we've learned about how it works and why we're vulnerable and why solutions aren't so simple. So disinformation is not simply false information. And sometimes it isn't false at all. To be effective, disinformation layers truth with lies, often building on a true or plausible core but then adding new details and omitting others to shape a specific narrative towards a, strategic, a specific strategic objective. In the IRA troll case, the troll accounts misled their audiences about who they were and what their intentions and motivations were. They attempted to shape political discourse and political action, in that case voting. The trolls pushed pro-Donald Trump messages on the right and anti-Clinton messages on the left. So they were trying to shape this sort of political action of the communities they infiltrated towards objectives that those communities, those communities themselves may not have been aware of and might not have shared. In the White Helmets case, we can see narratives like this one built from factual information. So the White Helmets do receive funding from Western governments and they, and they have advertised that. And they have, you know, there's, there have been White Helmets or, or volunteers that have done bad things. Um, but according to act, the activists in pink, use the, that, that kind of evidence, those kinds of things, um, to say that the media, uh, so say, sorry, to say that the white helmets are paid by Western governments to create propaganda meant to change how people see the war. It's a compelling narrative that's hard to problematize as simply true or false. It's strategic. Another insight from this work is that we need to consider or reconsider our unit of analysis. It's not always too effective to think of disinformation as a single piece of information, but instead, we should think of it as a campaign. Bittman used that, in, that unit of analysis. And borrowing from his characterization and our analyses of modern disinformation, we agree that it's useful to think of disinformation not as a quality of a specific piece of information, but as a collection of information actions or a campaign. Looking at the 2016 election interference in the United States, we can see a multi-channel, multi-dimensional campaign. On the IRA side, 
we talked about Twitter, but the troll account was multi-platform. Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, commenting on web articles and forums, making and distributing playlists on SoundCloud. Um, they were really profoundly multi-platform. Multi but it wasn't just a social media campaign or just the IRAs and its trolls. It included the release of stolen emails that had been repeatedly associated with Russian hackers, the use of gray propaganda sites to push their narratives, the manipulation of mainstream media in the West to spread their stolen content, and the infiltration of other social and political organizations. It's a campaign. It's all these things together. In the White House Helmets example, it's not just a single piece of information or a single narrative, but an onslaught of stories that built into several connective narratives using YouTube and Twitter and in combination with connected media strategies across dozens of gray propaganda sites, this effort sought to undermine the White Helmets, especially their efforts to garner sympathy from global audiences, but also to connect them to terrorists on one hand and narratives questioning um, Western intervention and challenging Western media on the other. I end with one of the most recent narratives, a tweet featuring an RT interview with a prominent journalist in this space, Vanessa Bealey where she claims that the white helmets are trafficking in the organs of children. And I'm going to leave that there. For the case of conspiracy theories, theories of crisis events, in part, these communities exist in a, kind of, a particular kind of information space or disinformation space where the echo of old campaigns can be heard within a community that has developed an epistemology or way of knowing that re renders them particularly vulnerable to additional disinformation that aligns with the meta-narratives of past disinformation campaigns. Perhaps these are views of the sort of the long-term effects of pervasive disinformation. I hope that they aren't a sign of things to come. Considering these two together, as we turn to questions of detection, which many of the, the technology folks in the room might be thinking about, it's an important area of research, especially in online environments. This means that identifying disinformation isn't about determining the truth value of a specific post or the authenticity of a single account. But we need to think about how that post and account fit into a larger campaign where the underlying attempt, sorry, the underlying intent is to mislead for a strategic political purpose. In this view, disinformation remains disinformation regardless of who the intermediary is. A person does not need to be aware of their role in the campaign to be a participant. And this is very difficult implications for technology companies wanting to address the spread of disinformation on their platforms. Because it's far easier to problem problematize and take action against paid trolls than it is to silence sincere activists, which is absolutely something I do not recommend. Right? So this is a much more difficult problem. And this gets to the point that we highlighted uh, in the title of this talk. And I didn't really cover it. I'm still trying to figure out how to, how, to, how to push this in here. But a lot of the research, it's not a criticism, but a lot of the research in this area is focused on detecting or on, on talking about or, or detecting automated activity, bots, and or inauthentic accounts or trolls. But disinformation isn't just about bots and trolls. As we can see in our studies, it targets, infiltrates, cultivates, shapes, and ultimately leverages online crowds and communities. Bittman talked about the role of unwitting agents, the role that they played in historical disinformation campaigns. Here we can see agents working with or collaborating with unwitting crowds to achieve their goals. I encourage researchers and platform designers not just to focus on the orange parts of the graph on the left, um, but to look at the blue and the pink on the graph on the right. To study how online communities are targeted and affected by disinformation, how some members of those unwitting crowds take it up and make it their own, eventually generating their own propaganda-like messages that reflect the narratives of the disinformation operatives. I want to underscore this. We have a tendency to think that disinformation affects other people, that we're somehow smarter or savvier or something. Um, but I would contest that we are all vulnerable to disinformation. Disinformation works. It is profoundly disorienting by design. We experience that as researchers in all of these spaces. Disorientation, not knowing what was true, what we could believe and what we couldn't believe. For the Black Lives Matter conversation, the lead researcher on our team, Emmer, has talked extensively about how hard it was to see the IRA content on the left as propaganda because it aligns so closely to his views. In the White Helmets conversation, it took our researchers weeks and in some cases months, and in some cases I'm not sure that one student ever finally came fully back, to recognize that what they were seeing was disinformation. 
Much of the content was targeted at people exactly like us, left-leaning, critical of US military intervention, and from diverse and, in many cases, international backgrounds. Things got easier for us when we began to see the patterns of, of information sharing and the connections to the, the Russia's disinformation apparatus. But we were still left with lingering doubt about the White Helmets and their mission, which was the whole point. They didn't ever have to convince us that they were all these horrible things. But they gave us just enough doubt that we would not take action or ask our political leaders to take action ab about what was going out there on there. So we're all, uh, yes, so we're all vulnerable. Um, looking beyond a single campaign, uh, the pervasive use of disinformation has consequences for the societies experiencing it. One of those is diminished trust in information. We've talked a lot about that here in different ways. Disinformation reduces our ability to know whom or what to trust with the idea that when people don't know where they can go for information that they can trust, they can lose their agency. We can get back on our heels. We don't know what action we can take because we're not sure about what's going on. And we, we lose our ability to take decisions based on a knowledge of the world if we don't trust our knowledge in that world. You can see in this example both the cause and the effect here, right? The per pervasive spread of conspiracy theories that there's a, there's a, you can't trust them. This is a direct attack. They're saying don't trust the mainstream media, but it's also reflecting this person doesn't trust the mainstream media. Um, and this is, we should all be critical, but this is a profound, like, absolute distrust as if the mainstream media is literally trying to trick us, uh, is, is, their, um, is their ideology now. And the IRA trolls played to this distrust, directly attacking media in the US. This is a tweet from one of the prominent IRA troll accounts, um, which is on the right. In this case, they were on the right, so the conservative side of our graph. This was sent in 2017, so after our collection period was shut down. But you can see them say, CNN is ISIS, right? We actually saw that exact same line as a hashtag in our Syria data set um, from some of the folks in pink. CNN is ISIS, right? This profound um, distrust uh, of media. But it's not just fake news or mainstream media that we, we're told we can't trust. It's also about just about anything you encounter online. If you think about the persistence of having trolls in these conversations, even making those trolls known has this effect to cause us not to trust what we see in these online spaces. That account you're arguing with, just label them a Russian troll and block them. Um, that article with information that makes you uncomfortable, that's just fake news. Uh, you don't want to believe that someone would take a gun into a school and, sh and shoot children? Just call it a hoax or a government conspiracy. Um, when I first saw the images of the Notre Dame Cathedral on fire, I thought it was a deep fake. Right? So we lose our trust in information spaces. And this loss of trust feeds into a more troubling point. Disinformation undermines democratic societies. It destabilizes the common ground that we need to stand upon to govern ourselves. It undermines our shared reality. We lose trust in information, in the, converse, in the confidence that we know what we know, and that things are as they seem. Notice the positioning in, of these orange clusters on this graph on the outside of these communities, helping to pull these communities further apart. Can't, can't, I haven't, can't measure that here, but that's sort of suggested here. It's empirical, but it's metaphorical. The disinformation tears at the social fabric amplifying existing divisions. If the division becomes too extreme, we can't come together to have conversations to make change, to govern ourselves, to change minds. If we can't come together, we can't, we can't have a democracy. Democracy doesn't work. Um, and then people uh, can turn towards more authoritarian leadership, or at least that's um, what we think we're seeing in, in some spaces. All right, so I'm going to shift um, to talking a little bit about solutions and then opening up for questions. Uh, I want to start here, um, that the tactics and effects of disinformation are resonating with features of socio-technical environments. Um, I use the word resonance here purposefully. I don't think social media caused disinformation. <laughs> um, they aren't a single root cause uh, of what's going on in, in, in the world. They're a factor. Things that are, the way that, tech, that, that these, these socio-technical systems have taken shape have um, uh, highlighted some of our vulnerabilities and, and become a vector of certain kinds of disinformation um, attacks. Social media didn't start this fire, but they've become the fuel for it. Uh, and additionally, because it's not simply cause and effect, we can't just engineer our way out of it. It's a complex problem, and solutions aren't going to be so simple as a new design feature on our favorite social media platform. But that doesn't mean we need to throw our hands up in defeat. I think this is really, really important. So I was on a panel about a year ago. 
and we were just talking about this information. And every time someone suggested a solution, like, oh, that won't work because of this. Oh, that won't work because of that. It's too hard. We're too vulnerable. Everything's going wrong. And we didn't even realize how badly um, we were, I, th I think we feel, felt defeated, but we were you know, expressing this defeatism. And we, it was in DC, and this, this guy stood up, and he, was a, he had been an ambassador. I, I actually don't know his name, but a lot of people there did. I'm not a DC person. I should have. Um, but he stood up, and this guy had been around a long time. And he got up, and he scolded us. And he said, you know, if we had had this kind of defeatism after, you know, during the Cold War or, or whatever, we never would have solved it. And people said, you know, this is unsolvable, and we've got this nuclear threat, and the world is going to blow up. And we just chipped away at the problem from all of these different sides, and eventually we solved it. And I um, have been thinking a lot about that since then. I felt uh, w chastised for good reason. I don't think that we're going to solve all of this information, the things that we're seeing, the toxicities that we're seeing online, or in the broader uh, society, all at once with a new tool, or a new law, or a new digital literacy class. It's a hard problem. But that doesn't mean we need to give up. In fact, that's the last thing we need to do. Um, we're not going to solve it all at once, but we are going to solve it. And we're going to solve it by chipping it away. We're going to chip away at all of these different ways. We need to you know, think about the new designs of technology. We need to think about new ways of educating, not just children, but all of us across K through 99. Um, journalism has a lot of work to do to make itself more trustworthy. Uh, there are good criticisms. The criticisms of journalism, the disinformation builds off of seeds of truth, right? So it builds off of, of times when journalism has made mistakes to, to, uh, to amplify those. And so journalism needs to improve itself. And, and clearly, um, we're going to have to talk about um, new policies. Uh, I want to um, I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to punt on the macro level pro policy right now, uh, where governments are going to put in policies. I'm still learning about that. It's one of the reasons I'm at Stanford this quarter. Um, but I talk here a little bit about platform policy. I have been in some conversations around that. So companies like Facebook and Twitter are increasingly working on these policies. They're communicating about them. They're putting them in place to help. Uh, address disinformation and other forms of online manipulation. Um, Facebook's been uh, focused on coordinated and authentic behavior. I think they're making some progress. They've got great people that are working hard on hard problems. They're not always making decisions that we agree with, but I, uh, I, I do think that they're, they're, they're working on it. Um, however, a lot of these policies, including Facebook's idea of, of focusing on coordinated and authentic behavior, I think they fall short when we start to think about the role of unwitting crowds. Um, so platforms are going to have their work cut out for them uh, as they uh, seek to balance things like freedom of speech um, with their inherent vulnerability to manipulation, where a subset of, of actors can manipulate the space to privilege their messages over others. We can also see an issue. Um, so I guess for my policy recommendations, it's actually to kind of think about our more nuanced view uh, of disinformation, thinking about it as a campaign that has a particular kind of intent. Uh, I think Facebook has been really reluctant to problematize on intent, and I actually don't think that we can address this information without considering the intent of the campaigns that we're looking at. And when, they had, when they're intended to mislead for strategic political purpose, I think that's what they need to be problematized. And not on a unit of analysis, a post or an account, but on sort of a broader campaign, and they need to take action against the campaign, even if, as it, as it spreads downstream, through intermediaries that are further and further away from the original agents that spread it. Um, I don't know exactly how they're going to do that, um, but uh, that's what I would encourage them to do. And as they do that, I think they're faced with a challenge that we need to appreciate um, and also kind of push them on. They call it working the refs. Uh, and that is that um, they're getting a lot of political pressure whenever they try to take action. It's because I, this is my, what I think, is that there are people that are in power now, um, perhaps people that have always been in power, uh, they've benefited from the manipulation of these platforms. They benefit from the spread of disinformation. And they're going to claim that any attempt to address that manipulation is biased or not neutral. But as many of us know, um, especially if you're in HCI, is that technology is neutral. There's no neutrality. There are values embedded in technology. It's not right versus left, but there's a commitment to certain kinds of values. And I would encourage the people that are uh, developing platforms for this sort of mass communication and information sharing to think about the value of supporting democratic discourse. 
of not allowing us to get pulled apart and not having this misleading information be so pervasive in our spaces. And I think I would encourage the tech platforms to identify and own those values, a value like that perhaps, and anchor themselves in, in that values to grow roots, or they risk getting bowled over by these disingenuous attacks that call them biased. And so um, with this call to, to own your values as you're designing things, I'm going to um, end this, say thank you. Um, also thank a lot of my students um, and collaborators who have uh, helped with this research and been foundational. And um, open this up for questions.